Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the June 11th, 2018 Board of Selectmen. Uh, we'll call this meeting to order. Minus one uh, select board member, but I'm sure he'll be along. Uh, consent agenda for tonight. We have the warrants, AP 1850, AP 1805, PR 1852S, AP 18512S, AP 1852S, AP 1901, AP 1851-2. We have established a uh, month of an ambulance oversight committee. Uh, appointments to ambulance oversight committee. Uh, I'm not sure if we're, do we, did we want to, you know, be okay with that? Um, well, we can always appoint these. And we may have to readjust that. Yes. Okay. Uh, appointment of special counsel and appointment of special employee retroactive to June 6th for Thomas Reedy. That would be the lawyer from the Senior Center. Appointment to the Fire Substation Building Committee, Eric Beal. Appointment Part-Time Dispatch, Brianna Yusko. Hadley Media Appointment, Glenn Clark. Resignation Alternate Plumbing Inspector, Richard Whitkus. Use of the Town Common. Most had the Holy Redeemer, August 5th, uh, for overflow parking and end of the year transfers, which we have not, uh, did you get them? Yeah, it's in your, okay. in your documents, but there are three of them. Three of them. Okay. $3,300 for the select board for professional development and uh, additional services for interpreters uh, during the extra town meeting. Uh, we have help on town insurances, which was a negative 20000 Six six four. That's because we've been upgrading our properties. We have a good wastewater and uh, and uh, roofing, and so that increased our property values. And then finally, the financial audit for FY17 short fifteen hundred dollars. And all of these can be transferred uh, covered by transfers to close out the uh, fiscal year two thousand eighteen. So I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Second. Any further discussion? Did uh, you did you need info? Mike asked me to present Brianna Yushka, or are you all set? If you would like to, that would be that would be trying. Yes, please. So uh, Brianna was interviewed for the per diem dispatcher position and we just put a quick thing together for you on her bio. So Brianna is a uh, Yushka was a resident of Hadley and graduated from Hopkins Academy in 2009. Uh, she was also a member of the Hadley Fire Department on the call force. She started her senior year of high school, 11 of 09. Uh, she's currently employed by the city of Northampton as a full-time emergency dispatcher and has all of the necessary certifications to begin training immediately. She currently works the midnight shift and has been employed by the city of Northampton since 2014. And I think she's going to be a home run for us. Thank you. Eric Beal, did you know about him coming on the fire substation committee? No. Uh, I didn't either. We had talked about it. Um, was there opening some? I fire? think there's still one additional. One additional. Opening. But that's great. Love to have okay. Mr. Beal. So, you know, you know. Yeah. Okay. Um, Hadley Media appointment of Glenn Clark for the open position there too. And resignation of alternate plumbing inspector Richard Whitfus. I missed those two things there. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, and we'll go right to the, if you don't mind, David, we'll go right to the um, audit presentation. Mm -hmm. We'll get you in and out. Get out of the way. Here's some. I have them. So, my name is Tammy Campbell, I'm from Melanson Heath, and I'm the partner in charge of the town's audit. I'm here tonight to present the results of the town's fiscal year 2017 audit, so primarily the financial statements and the management letter. 
Um, I'd like to start by just giving a brief overview of what an audit does and does not do. Um, as an auditor, we often find there, there can be this misconception when people hear the term audit, they think that we come in and we pour through every single transaction that passed through the town during the fiscal year. And that is not the case. An audit is not designed to um, review 100% of the transactions that come in and out of, of the town on a daily basis, um, nor does it um, provide assurance that um, every single transaction is processed in accordance with town policies and procedures or even state and federal laws and regulations. Instead, audits are conducted under um, a set of standards known as government auditing standards. And those standards require that we plan and perform our audit using a concept known as materiality. Now, materiality will vary based on the size of the entity. So for instance, materiality for a large city will be different from that of a small town. In fiscal year 2017, the materiality for the town's general fund, your main operating fund, was about $125,000. That doesn't mean we don't look at anything below that amount, because we certainly do. It just means that auditing standards say we should focus our testing on transactions and balances at or above that level. Now, during our audit, we spend a good deal of our time in the more significant higher risk departments, such as the treasurer's office, the collector's office, the assessor's office, and of uh, course the accounting department. Um, we perform a couple different types of testing during our audit. We perform evaluations of the town's um, major processes, so like your cash receipt process, your cash disbursement process, and uh, your payroll process, just to name a few. And then we design procedures to test those controls and make sure they're operating effectively during the period under audit. We also perform what's known as substantive testing to make sure that the balances that are reported in the town's general ledger and ultimately in the financial statements are accurately or adequately supported. Um, so for instance, we'll test to make sure that your cash balance in the general ledger is supported by reconciled bank statements from the treasurer's office or that your receivable balances are supported by um, a detailed balance due listing from the collector's office. We also perform a bunch of um, various analytical and review procedures like during the audit. Um, now, I know that was like a very brief overview of what we do. Does anyone have any questions about that? Or, you know, feel free to stop me at any point in time if you do have, you know, questions about what I'm talking about. Um, I don't know if you guys have copies of, the, okay, perfect. You just don't have the actual paper. Um, I'm going to start by looking at the financial statements, which is the bigger of the two documents. Now, the town's financial statements are presented under rules established by the Government Accounting Standards Board, or GASB. And there are essentially five parts to the financial statements, or sections to the financial statements. There's the audit opinion, management, management discussion and analysis, two sets of financial statements, and then the footnotes. The audit opinion is the only part of the financial statements that actually belongs to us. And in fiscal year 2017, we issued the town an unmodified opinion on the financial statements, which is the best uh, opinion we can issue anyone. Um, and, ba and that means basically that based on the results of our audit testing, we felt that the town was in compliance with generally accepted accounting principles. Or known as GAP. After the audit opinion comes management's discussion analysis, which is like an executive summary to the financial statements. It um, provides a brief overview of what's included in the financial statements as well as some of the key numbers and results of operations for the past fiscal year. So if you want the abbreviated version, that's a good place to kind of start and, and look at things. After that come your two sets of financial statements themselves. You have your government-wide statements and your fund basis statements. And we're going to start by looking at the government, one of the government-wide statements, which is on page 11. Now page 11 is a statement in that position, which is similar to a balance sheet. This statement is one of your government-wide 
um, statements, and it is essentially Gatsby's way of taking a governmental operations and showing it like a business. So you report um, the town's funds in two columns. You have your governmental activities column, which represents um, the town's general fund, your stabilization fund, your um, special revenue or grant fund, your capital project funds, those are in that, that column. And then your business type activities column is, your, is the town's enterprise funds. So that's um, the separation between the two there. Um, and in order to create these statements, we essentially take your fund basis financial statements and add things such as your capital assets, your bonds payable, and your other long-term liabilities like your net pension liability and your net OPEP obligation. So while these statements do do a good job in terms of showing like the true assets and liabilities of the town, they're not as meaningful to the end users of the financial statements, the governing body for instance, or even financial advisors and um, bond rating agencies don't spend a lot of time with these statements because these are not what you're using on a daily basis to make your decisions. It's not how you set your budget. You know, there are certain numbers on here that are important and you know, they do look at those, but otherwise you're not using these on a daily basis to make decisions. I do want to talk about a couple of the numbers on the page though. Um, about three quarters of the way down the page under the non-current liabilities, you'll see your um, net OPEP obligation. At the end of fiscal year 2017, that liability was about $5.2 million. If you recall, when um, the standard was issued that required cities and towns to book this liability, they allowed the, the uh, GASB allowed you to calculate the total liability, amortize it over a 30 year period, and basically book a little bit of that, that liability every year. So as of 2017, you have about seven years of that liability booked. Um, they have since changed their mind and um, issued two new standards that um, replace the previous standard they issued. Um, and in fiscal year 2017, because the town has an OPEP trust fund, you are required to implement um, Gatsby standard number 74. Now, that standard did not change any of the numbers actually reported in your financial statements. What it did was add some additional um, footnote information and some schedules at the back of the financial statements that include information about your OPEP trust fund um, and what the total liability will be. Next year, the town will be required to implement statement number 75, which is gonna require you to book the entire liability, um, which in your case, you know, increases the liability from 5.2 million to like 6.9 million, somewhere around there based on the most recent um, information we have from the actuary. So <coughs> it doesn't actually increase it as much as we've seen in like other cities and towns. And I think a lot of that, the reason for that is the town has put a good amount of money into the OPEP trust fund and has a clear, you know, kind of funding schedule for that. At the end of 2017, um, there was about $840,000 in your trust fund, in the OPEP trust fund, um, which puts you at about just under 11% funded, which isn't huge, but compared to a lot of other cities and towns we've seen, that's um, on the higher side in terms of percent funded. So um, I think that plays a, a big role in terms of like your liability not increasing by a substantial amount. Um, from this year to next year. A lot of people are seeing, you know, 10 plus million dollar jumps in their, their liability. So that is good news there, I guess. If, um, we wanna look at it that way in terms of what your, uh, what your balance sheet will look like next year. Um, does anyone have any questions on, on the OPEB liability? I guess I probably should have explained before I started that, but the OPEB liability is your unfunded retiree health insurance costs. So well, we know what it is. Yeah, I'm like, I'm sure everyone's aware of that. I'm not sure that right. Um, we have heard this, this for, for, right. four or five years. I'm sorry to cut in like that, but it's... No, 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 I know, I know. Don't feel sorry.
sorry you didn't explain it to us for I know. sure. <laughs> okay, I'm glad I didn't have to explain that to you. Let me just put it that way. Right. Yeah. Um, my, my only question, though, would be you said it's $6.9 million in 2017. Would it be what we need in, to have in, in there? Uh, no, I'm sorry. So you're, yeah. No, it's okay. Your liability at the end of 17 is about $5.2 million. Yeah. Next year, when we are required to record the full liability, it's going to increase to about $6.9 million. So will we have to put more than we're currently contributing to meet the standard, or are we good with No, you're good. I mean, there's no requirement to fund the liability at this time that, you know, down the road I wouldn't be surprised if something comes out that requires you to fund it, but you're putting in kind of whatever you can or whatever the town decides to put in. Um, the, actuar the actuary is determining what your total liability is based on your employees, mort mortality rates, um, you know, employees. health insurance cost rates, like all these crazy things that I don't want to know what actuaries do, but um, so they calculate, calculate what the liability is and how much you put into the trust every year um, changes or like reduces that li that future liability. So um, it doesn't mean you have to contribute any more per se. You know, you're, you might reevaluate it just because there are new standards and um, they do have to calculate the liability slightly differently and they have to use different percentages and stuff like that, but um, it doesn't mean that you guys um, have to change what you're doing now. That's a whole separate report we'll get from um, Parker Belmore. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's when we talk about. Nice. Yeah, that's about as good a read as a financial statement. Mm -hmm. so, Some yeah. towns haven't done nothing. Oh yeah, I know, I know. So yeah, I know. no, there's. Yeah. And I know we already put in more than we would oh, yeah. like to right now, but you know, I'm just wondering well, if we're trying to keep up. No, with it. Yeah, there's we're no trying to keep up with it, but yeah, it's a big. It's a big it problem. is a big number. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Another big number on this page is um, the line right above that is your net pension liability, which um, the town was required to book for the first time a couple years ago. That number represents the town share of the um, Hampshire County Retirement System's unfunded liability. The town itself is about 4.7% of the total system, so you're booking essentially 4.7% of the unfunded liability of the, of the, the system itself. So that's what that, um, that's what that number represents, and every couple of years they have a new they get their own actuary evaluation and it gets adjusted based on, you know, how well they did compared to what they thought they would do in investments and, and things along that line. And, and I'm sure your funding schedule gets adjusted kind of accordingly um, uh, for those for those changes. So um, that's all I was gonna talk about on this page unless anyone had any other specific questions. Is the retirement one hundred percent or is that going up in, uh, in, in the pieces like OPEB was. No, nope, that is the fine. entire the entire liability, which is kind of why I think they changed their mind on on the OPEB. On the OPEB. They you know, issued the standard for net pension and we're like, well, this is kind of similar to OPEB, so okay. maybe we should just book the full amount. So I think they were trying to be nice and didn't want everyone to like book this huge liability all at once and then they clearly got over that. So um, now everyone will have a, a much larger liability. That's a good question, though. I get that a lot. Okay. Um, the next page I want to look at was page 13. <clears throat> now, 13 is one of your fund basis financial statements, which is um, a little more in line to what you're used to looking at <clears throat> when you get a report from the town accountant, um, <clears throat> with the exception of a, of a few things. Your up to the far right, you have your non-major governmental funds. Um, that column there consolidates um, your special revenue and your grant funds. Um, some of your trust funds are, are grouped in that in that column. Um, <clears throat> the capital project fund and your community preservation fund they qualify as what are known as major funds, which, which is why they're presented separately in here. Um, and you can see those as separate columns in the financial statements. Now your water fund, um, although it is an enterprise fund in terms of how the town treats it and operates, um, it doesn't qualify as an enterprise fund for financial reporting purposes because the definition of an enterprise fund um, means that it has to cover all of its 
um, all of its expenses, and it doesn't pay all of the debt that's associated with that fund. So it's reported as um, a non-major or a, um, a governmental fund in your financial statements. Has no effect or bearing on how um, the town budgets or does anything like that. It's just how it's presented under the rule, the um, accounting rules. So that's why you see that fund here and not with your sewer or your cable enterprise funds on um, the statements kind of later on. Your, the first column there, the general column, is, that's your general fund, but it also includes your stabilization fund balance. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard this explanation before, but it, um, a few years ago, Gatsby issued another one of their famous standards which required um, the stabilization fund to be combined with the general fund. Um, for financial statement presentation purposes in order to align how um, all governmental entities were reporting their, their, um, their stabilization slash rainy day funds. On the state level, the rainy day fund is part of their general fund, so they felt that on the city and town level, in order to make them look similar to state governments, they should be grouped with the general fund. So. The, um, the balance in your unassigned fund balance, down towards the bottom of your page there, the, the $3 million, 2.1 of that is, 2.1 million of that is your stabilization fund, which represents about 13% of the town's annual budget, which is a very healthy um, stabilization fund balance. On, again, on the higher side in terms of what I'm seeing, um, in terms of percentage of your annual budget. Um, that you have set aside in that one. So that's, um, that is a good indicator. Um, the rest of that, the, about 900000 that's your general fund unassigned or unreserved fund balance, which is essentially like your um, starting point for your free cash calculation. So it's money that you have not reserved for other purposes in your general fund. Again, that's about 6% of the town's annual budget which is, is healthy, it's, um, as always, it could be higher, but um, it is still a, a very healthy number considering you have so much money you know, set aside in your stabilization and your trust funds, so, um, so that is good as well. Um, that was all I was gonna touch on in the financial statements unless anyone you know, read through it and had questions on any of the, any of the numbers or, Just or question. questions. Excuse <coughs> me. Management discussion and analysis. Mm -hmm. So, was that something we write and provide to you? It's not. Most um, cities and towns, we just prepare it for them. It's a required um, section, and there's certain things that are, are required to be presented in it. There is an option to add, kind of at the end, um, uh, footnote E or something like that, that, that the town could talk about either current year results or future um, future plans, things like that. There is there is that option you could do that if you it's something you guys would like to and do. And then you would just have to audit the numbers that are included in whatever the town provides to make sure. Yeah, we kinda of have to look look at it for reasonless. I mean these are your financial statements. Mm -hmm. You know, they write like so um, we just compile them in accordance with the Gatsby standards. Um, but yes, you certainly could provide um, provide uh, information if you wanted to uh, about the, the current year results or looking forward to next year, things along that line. Mm -hmm. so, all right. So after um, the financial statements come the footnotes, which basically provide more detailed information about the numbers that are reported in your financial statements themselves. So, um, now, in terms of management, I don't know if you guys wanted me to, to go into great detail about it. There's, there's two comments this year. Um, both of them are just general um, suggestions for improvement or, or changes. But, you know, if you read the responses provided by management, both of, both of them have been, um, I believe, addressed at this point in time. Neither of them were um, what we call either a significant deficiency or a material weakness that would mean that there was such a large deficiency in the town's internal control structure that we feel it would need to get brought um, to the attention of management. Um, so that's a, that's a good thing. But I can talk about them if you like. I don't know if you 
really up to you guys. I don't think you, I don't think you have to. Okay. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to bring to our attention or that was? No, no, no. no I think so. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Great night. It's good to know we're not in too rough shape. Yeah. The whole baby now? Maybe four and a well. Yeah, yeah. not a baby. Yeah. No. Four, six, eight, and ten. <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much, Diane. Yeah, you. you're welcome. Have a good night. <laughs> you too. Oh, yeah. Anybody here for public comment tonight? No? I guess I'm good. Did you have anyone for public comment? No, I was just saying I wasn't sure if John was here. Did you, want before? Did you want to say something, Marlon? Yeah, just real quick. Um, as most of you know, we're, we're um, inspecting the sewer lines on Route 9, the, the rest of the length from, from where we left off. We're about halfway in. Uh, I met with the, the person in charge today, and we have found nothing to this point where it's an emergency case basis. So I, I wanted to get that out there that we still got a ways to go. but. Uh, Things are looking a lot better than they were in the, last, the first 2,000 feet. So I just wanted to give a quick update in case anybody was wondering. And I guess, well, at this point, while you're talking, we could say that you were elected to the Tri County Board. Oh, yes. In your position. Would you like to explain what, what that's all about? Um, well, the Tri County Board is um, it's, it's uh, three counties, directors on a board. Um, I was actually uh, selected for the um, uh, Hampshire County uh, director. Uh, I'll represent Hampshire County, uh, like when we go to move meetings to Boston at the highway level, uh, report back, and then I report back the information to the, to the directors in Hampshire County. So, Congratulations. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It's an honor out of everybody to be appointed, so yeah. we're very proud of that also. Thank it's you. a good thing. So it's a little old hat. A little old hat. We get yeah. in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on, the, on the big stage. Show how it's done. Show <laughs> well, I, I got a phone call today. They're looking for a representative for the higher level, but I don't think I have the time for that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so. we'll, we'll keep you busy enough. Well, there's, a, there's a lot of retirements, you know, through the system and whatnot, <laughs> so. Um, you know, I want to get my feet wet in this position before I uh, head for 14 meetings a year down in Boston and report back to the whole. Yeah, but those connections are, I mean, seriously, they're they're important. And I know, you know, Mike's done work at the regional level, and, you know, it's it, it's the networking that happens as much as the communication, you know, right? So mm -hmm. I think, again, we're a small town, so it's nice for us to have the representation data on the small, small town task force. I mean, those... They've come in handy over the years, so we yeah. appreciate it. You know, I, I've been a member of um, the system for, I don't know, probably 12, 13 years, but uh, you gather a lot of information. There's a lot of interneting, you know, interworking when you have your meetings and whatnot, so it's helpful to, to me in my position, too, uh, when, you, when you see how other directors, you know, operate their business and whatnot, so. Um, and we'll, we'll be tipped off to good information ahead of time, too, um, which, will be, which will be good. We know what's coming down the pike. They, they just had the recent meeting. They had a person come in from uh, that will be running the new OSHA, and uh, the gentleman spoke to us for a while, so kind of gave a little guidance uh, where we need to go as DPW directors from from this point. So, nice. Uh, so thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's do um, ambulance update, and then we can do. Uh, I think also fire substation committee. If we have anything there. Get my guy here. So I was able to get some uh, info for you. So you can see the first, yeah, well, we're, we're flying here. So, uh, <laughs> I was ready to cry when he called me to tell me it had taken off and they were all in the so, first, yeah. like first day. Some stuff so. has been redacted, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, but just so you know, this is also the new data system that was just employed as of July 1st for the fire department. So we have a real robust pre tool to be able to give you fire department information as well. So this first one we put together today, uh, it is not, this is a draft, so it's not um, official. So you can see some of the response times. I can tell you in the first six days, uh, we did 27 responses. Um, thank you. Uh, so here's a graph of um, micro walk for the first six days. Thank you. 
Real basic. And then this last part is, um, this is the new Hadley Fire Department software, so you'll be able to see our full time and call force responses. It breaks it down by response for EMS and fire. So this is making our lives so it's clicking a couple buttons and bam, we So it's entering the information is the difficult part. All of our folks are being trained on it right now, so when they come back from a call, they enter the information and. Did you have another one of these for David? Oh, sorry. Can I just ask um, on the, the units where it says had the medic one, had the medic two? So had the medic one obviously is the one housed at Central, Correct. and then medic two would be another one coming in. Medic two is the one that's stationed at the, at the bridge, uh, at the bridge okay. and they have been consistent about staffing that 16 hours a day. Uh, and then Medic 3 is not reserved for the town of Hadley, nor is Medic 2. So Medic 2 will go out of service to, to Holyoke, but they let us know that. Uh, Medic 3 is dispatched up if Medic 1 and 2 are out on calls. Um, anyways, so that's been working quite well. Uh, we started June 29th. At 9 a.m., everybody was at the station. David came over with us, and Molly, you stopped in. So the tension was like, oh my gosh, you know, the buttons are switched, everything <laughs> changed over. We're all like, and then 9 o'clock came, and it was silent. Birds were chirping. And <laughs> so, uh, however, uh, so we thought we jinxed ourselves being so upset about uh, getting all this together. The dispatching protocols are all in place, they all have been working out very well. Uh, very simple language change, um, so so that was good. We worked really hard on that, um, and then that afternoon on the first day, we we had a little test. So we had a multiple motor vehicle accident on Route Nine, required two ambulances. Uh, lucky enough, uh, Assistant Chief Stromgren and one of his firefighters was driving back from picking up an ambulance, so they stopped on scene and were assisting with it. Um, then we had. An additional call up the street for a car on a tree. That turned out to be a refusal, which worked out well. Our protocol now is uh, action is very. Their their emergency room doctor requires them to actually have accurate refusal forms. So myself and uh, Deputy Chief Bryant were on scene first, and the 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 gentleman there with his child said, um, "I have no desire to go to the hospital. My wife's on her way up." Um, our protocol, we asked them, would you mind waiting? We could have done a paper form like we've always done. Uh, the uh, fly car came up with a paramedic in it, did their evaluation, and a, you know, a true uh, refusal form was generated. So that's nice. Um, and it, onwards, and it just like, it snowballed. So you can see the, the number of runs in the first, uh, first six days was pretty intense. So question for you, on the medic ones that stationed out there, are we transporting to base the base state? If if it's if it's called for, yes. Okay. Yes. And so what was the call going to Franklin Medical? Why why north instead of that was a that was a request at Hadley um at Oh so so that was an emergent call that required an ambulance to transport. Okay. So not a trans it wasn't a transfer or anything like that. So we've only had one mutual aid call the whole time? Actually, we've had uh, we've had more than one mutual aid call, so the mutual aid calls aren't completely reflected in there. Okay. So, um, like I said, this is all initial reporting. I can tell you, um, so those, just to you know, to let you know, those first that first six days was, it was really quite impressive. So the fluidity of it that we had been told about, where an ambulance is clearing up at the hospital, their transport times, uh, you can see a four and a half minute response time. Um, I mean, they're they're going there and they're getting they're getting the patient quickly to the hospital and coming back. Um, so it's it's been very nice. Uh, we had a ro rollover accident uh, on North Maple Street or South Maple Street, I should say. Uh, so extrication, working with that team. So our our firefighter EMT is working with action immediately, like arriving on scene at the same time. It's it's quite impressive. Uh, and then yesterday. Uh, we really truly tested the system and in a matter of an hour we had five five calls uh, so we had two motor vehicle accidents and then three medicals came in all at the same time so uh, at the same time Holyoke was going crazy so their med free was unavailable we went to our run cards Amherst had a, uh, a fire at the, at the university so their ambulances were not available because all their staff was dealing with that. So we went to Northampton, 
for one mutual aid ambulance and one to South Hadley District 1. And all of it was, other than the dispatcher's head spinning uh, because of the number of calls, <coughs> um, everybody was transported and was given care. I can tell you that myself and Firefighter Bordeaux uh, were at one of the calls and initiated care until Northampton arrived. Uh, so it's, it's really been quite the team approach and has been up to now has been outstanding. The folks that are, have been coming up here are actually, they're liking it so much they're p picking up extra shifts. So we're seeing the same faces. So we're really starting to develop the relationship. They're starting to understand how we're working. They're going out with our new folks on driver training to get used to the streets. We've been giving them information on, you know, the, the heavy to do spots and what to expect. Um, and it, it's been quite nice. We, I did have a meeting with Evan Bryant and action with the emergency room doctor at Cooley Dickinson. Uh, we are under a provisional until all of their paramedics go through their, they have to have four hours of a four hour block with the ER doc. So that all the permits and, and stuff has been, has been gone through, that's all in process and they're, they've started that process of getting all the paramedics into their, their time with the ER doctor and it's, it's working well. So on, on this graph here where it says Elaine, Center at Hadley. Mm -hmm. I assume that's just the high frequency call locations. That's why it's highlighted up there. That is one of them. Yes. Okay. So, um, and I do. I do want to add that Chief Mason said that his officers are extremely pleased that when they go to a call, that there's a very limited amount of time when uh, an ambulance has been called, and they're right there on the scene. So everybody has has been working well together and. Um, they're very happy too. So mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's a good public safety thing yep. going on right now, and uh, we'll just keep on rolling. Yep. So we have uh, the only other thing we're waiting for is we are working with Amherst still. We're waiting for the mutual aid agreements and just want to work through that. Uh, they obviously they're coming to the call, the calls when asked, but we just need to finish up that that process. And I'm working with David on that. Mm -hmm. Have you guys had any other mutual aid agreements the other way, like us going somewhere else? Not at this point. Uh, so they've put that into my hands for doing it, and we wanted to make sure that we're really, that we can kind of get an evaluation of where we're at. Uh, Northampton is very interested in moving our ambulance up on their run card for structure fires so that they can have firefighters heading to the scene to cover their, their community. Action's more than willing to assist with that, more with their Medic 2. Um, not with our medic one, so we're not, no community wants to dump their town. If it's required, we'll do it, but um, we wanna make sure that we have the ability to, you know, get an ambulance out and, and get it to our community members if needed. We don't want the system to be strained, which it was yesterday. One of the things we were talking about before was that uh, now that we have a distinctive ambulance in town rather than just Amherst Fire Department, I've had a ton of comments of, wow, I see that thing everywhere. It's busy, it's always, always moving. So I, I think people didn't quite realize how busy the you know, Amherst yeah. Fire Department was covering Hadley at the mm -hmm. time. So I think it's a good thing. And uh, like you said, a four or four and a half minute response time is uh, quite a bit better than what we had. So. We've also been continuing the outreach. So we were at the library yesterday and I was really surprised with the number of little kids that actually said, we got the big yellow fire truck, we want the ambulance. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was great. You've and, been relegated. <laughs> yeah. and tomorrow, tomorrow we're actually going to Winfield uh, uh, Senior Estates <coughs> to meet with all the, the folks over there. They requested a meeting with the ambulance. So we're, we're gonna be over there in the morning uh, with an ambulance because they want to see the ambulance too. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, it's been working well. We're, uh, our quarters, uh, we're, working on, so we're working on some concepts for some better ideas of housing. Uh, just because of the location and what's going on in the building. So we've been working on that and uh, we're working with Action to see if they can maybe assist with the costs on it. And it would be something that would probably be uh, for us in the, in the future as well as a, you know, as something for when we're expanding uh, with our staff. But like I said, they're, they help out with cleaning the station. We have duty assignments now for both groups. So in the morning, you know, they're cleaning up the kitchen, they're cleaning up the bathrooms and and uh, cleaning trucks and making sure everything's in order. So it's it's actually, it's quite exciting. We're still, ex I mean, you can see how busy we are. Uh, the nighttime, so after six, it's still, it's still stressful. You know, we still have a lot of medical calls and a lot of calls for the fire service side of it. And, um, 
you know, we're still we're still lacking there. So that's the discussion we'll, we'll be working on next. And hopefully, with the continuation of the ambulance oversight committee, we can start reviewing these numbers and this actual information. And I think that you're going to see that you know action has already offered to have an additional ambulance on the station, and we're working on that plan for within the next six months to a year that they would be, you know, we would be assisting with staffing to have that second ambulance in the station or up north and or something, something along those lines. So we're providing an additional piece of equipment with the staffing that we have on already. All right, so since you've mentioned up north, um, how about we'll roll into the fire substation building project. Where, where are we at with that? Where do we want to get started on that? So the uh, OPM, Phil Palumbo, was away last week. Uh, he has spoken with the architect and they've requested a meeting for next Thursday. So we will be doing our kickoff meeting to get going again with that. And we'll sit down and, and start and pick up where we left off, basically. So who's there's really architect? no information at this point. Who's your architect on it? Do you know? You know Is it somebody that's working in the current? We don't have, no. They yes, they, there's don't have one the yet. OPM. We OPM. have an architect because we did the initial design did, for the notch so. North Adley ball field. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the that person that put that design together um, is is part of the OPM's project team. You're right, though. It's been corrected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, yeah. thank you. Caleb, yeah. yeah. So they don't have to go back out? No. Oh, that's good. Basically, they're, the way we're looking at it is the, the design that they have, it's just relocating it onto a new site. There might be some tweaks, but we're trying to limit any costs for changes on that. So whatever we can do to, to make that work well, on the new site. we don't have to bring any of the fill or any of Correct. that stuff in, you know, that we were going to have to do to the other one. So that's going to cut some costs mm -hmm. uh, on the other fill, fill yep. too. So, um, yeah. Do we have a plan on how there were some abutters who had um, repeatedly expressed an interest in, in purchasing property. Yeah, yeah carving off a slice. I mean, do we know how we're going to deal with that? Yeah, so right now the, uh, the select board signed a lease which is going to ex uh, expire in about six weeks for a uh, farmer to use the property. So when that's done, I've given the uh, OPM the site survey. One of the things that will be revealed in the site survey is that that tobacco barn is a couple of inches across somebody else's uh, property line. So we're going to either have to tear down that barn and or carve out a certain part of that southern uh, part of the lot in order to correct that deficiency. And this is something that just happened back in the old days. Build a barn here. Yeah. It, looks, it looks good. But then there's also somebody on the other the side. side <laughs> so, yeah. so that would be something that I would bring to the select board, I think, probably in September once we're through that agricultural lease. Okay. I just want to make sure because when it came up, we promised, you know, that at least it would be given audience. So yeah. I just want to make sure it didn't get well, lost. And we want, well, first and most of all, is that we want to be Cyber sure building. what we're going to put ours first, and then we'll figure out about where extra mm -hmm. property we have. Mm -hmm. So our project comes first, and then we'll deal with everybody else's request after that. I did receive an anonymous letter from on that about um, the properties up there, and just making sure that everything's reviewed first before there's any offers out for, for purchase of the property. Yeah. Or if there was any offers for, you know. It didn't sound like that letter needed to be anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was. <laughs> so so our, our project comes first and mm -hmm. where we're going to place the building and then we'll go from there. The right. Bagel Barn probably ain't a big issue, so that... No, it's at that, the other end of the yeah, field. It's yeah. over by Sojinski. So Isn't that Sojinski's property? Uh, Who's that property that puts it? McCreskey's, I thought. Is it? Yeah. yeah. The Paul, Paul behind Paul's, his house? Paul. Yeah. So, you know, Paul is interested in saving that barn. Mm -hmm. you know, okay. 20 feet or whatever, 30 feet or whatever. Well, you got 15 foot east on the side of the barn. Kind of make it legal if we do, are going to go on square off the property, you know, as long as we got room. Okay, we'll take a look at it when it comes to when we move along. Before Mike leaves us, can I ask a question that's actually related to the Senior Center project? But it involves Mike. 
want to invoke him as an expert testimony. Oh boy. <laughs> Can you explain 15, just because John just mentioned it, 15 foot easement, 30 foot easement, what is a requirement of the fire department related to the easement coming from the proposed senior center siting out to Russell Street? If yeah, hearing conversation yeah. about it having to do with requirement the driveway the width you mean for the emergency <coughs> vehicle the access that's going to be cut off so yeah exactly yeah, yeah that, that question was asked to me by multiple folks and it's actually it, it's more of a curb cut issue versus where it's not a curb cut so basically what we're looking at is the width for fire lane access and the reason why we're requesting that they keep it the full size is it's kind of a tight turn there and i'm sorry full size being 30? Whatever is proposed on the plan, I think it was 30 or 34 feet, because uh, it was, a, I think there was something about cutting it down to you 24. Could, you said dri driveway cuts 30s. Yeah, I think it's 30 on so the So it's 30 on driveway cut, cut, and it's 15 feet on the back and the sides, and then it's 50 foot setback in the front, whichever the front. You're talking about the driveway, or? No, no, she's, she asked both questions, the easement on all sides of the building and the driveway. The easement on the sides of the building I can't answer to. The only the only setback we have is for the propane tanks. So the propane tanks or something require distance off of the building and then distance off of the lot line. Mm -hmm. And if there's any wetlands or anything like that, there's conservation requirements. Mm -hmm. But as far as the driveway coming in, there was a question as to whether they could reduce the size. I don't think it was from the senior center. It was something else. It was the review, the uh, peer review, or in the in something in the peer review the requirement is i'm going to get the numbers wrong 25 feet and we have 30 feet or something like that yeah. so they basically wanted yeah something from you to say oh the 30 foot is for the turning radius it's fine type of thing and that's that's what was done so they yeah. did the turn radius and that's why originally they weren't going to have the raised curbs uh but then they came back and said that they wanted it so that you wouldn't have somebody potentially getting hit by a car because there's no, you know, those curbs actually provide protection. Uh, but, you know, we wanted to make sure that we kept that turn radius and that's why it's at that 30 whatever feet. It's, it's 30 feet right now. Yeah. So it's isn't that generally. pretty standard though for uh, emergency e-access out of uh, even say like Grand Oak over there, they put in that street for emergency ac uh, access so you'd have two on one area? Yeah, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's always, it's, it. it's, yeah, I mean, th there's been discussions about making it tr a true fire lane, you know, uh, putting some sort of a, uh, putting bollards with a chain up or something, so those are still, you know, issues that are being discussed, so it's not being used as a driveway in and out all the time, but if there's an event, you can take the chain down and, they Usually you have, know. like, a breakaway chain yeah. that you can just, yeah. Roll through. Yep. We'll scratch our fire truck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a plastic chain. No. So no. Those, <laughs> Breakaway as we just cut it. What Mike just said, does that make sense relative to the conversation you had today with the OPM? Well, I think he has a different idea. So the, my understanding is that the 30 feet applies for the intersection of uh, that driveway, the easement, and Route 9. And we're talking about a curb cut here. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's maybe where we're not talking about the same thing. I was told about the access between the Legion and uh, the Hadley Senior Center. Is that's where about I, that's where I was talking about. Increasing the easement width. Yes. That's what that's I heard. The question. That yeah. The so that's I think that's because we have the existing thirty foot right of way, which that could be. You know that's a broad definition mm -hmm. and then we need another 30 feet to match up to that existing curb cut that would get you into the senior center parking lot mm -hmm. so it's what we need is 60 feet of my total pieces well, I mean, we're not landing airplanes so yeah. no. <laughs> no but it's we don't, I don't need know. a 60 foot. Yeah, that's not required right. in any. Well, 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 huh? this is it's because of the way the property is laid out. I don't, you know, I'm just saying that's what they <coughs> have on their plans right now. That's not right. Because they're going to do parking over the right of way right. and then because a fire we, lane we next to that. We wanted to make sure that we maximize the Legion parking. Yeah. 
So, okay. When the discussion so, first came up, the parking spaces that are on that westerly border right yeah, now, yeah, yeah. we wanted to leave them and just keep the yeah. access that the, is there now that goes yes. up to the rear. So the existing entrance, yes. pretty much. That's, right. I think that's side. it. Is there is that existing path there, but it's mm -hmm. not necessarily. We don't have any kind of agreement for that existing path right, right. now. Could you theoretically do a swap? We'd still need that 30 foot right of way that we have currently for all the utilities. Correct. Yeah. Unless we put them under the road or something like that. But that was one of the initial discussions and agreements, I believe, was keeping the parking there yeah. and then moving the access. Oh, yeah, we want to keep access. the parking there for the Legion. Yeah. Your utilities are going underground anyway. You're going to pay you over them anyway. Yeah, and that's where the parking would be. Right, so that's right. okay. Yeah. Okay. But then we need another 30 feet for that, right, that emergency access. That's the problem. That that wasn't well, that, see they, that wasn't asked of me. So if I think that's maybe where the yeah, discrepancy but they, that's is. Yeah, but they wanted barriers in there. I can show you this too. What they're proposing. Maybe it would be better if you see that image. But that's uh, yeah, that's the one I saw. But there's yeah. no that's barriers there. there. No. There's, no there's no barriers. There's no barriers. No. Yeah, no. It's just, so there's still an access. Nine yeah. times out of ten, there's not going to be any parking in the back over there. That's always going to be up closer to the building itself. Um, that's for other functions that they might have there. I mean, is the concern that the, the Legion might put up a structure there and not allow the... I think that it was just I mean, trying to make sure we ensure that being a, f a fire lane or emergency access route, because it's in the plans right now. Okay. So I think it's more about... You're still going through their driveway. Yeah, it's about going through their driveway and do, do we want to maintain that as some kind of legal or have like an well, easement in there. From we can't just no. put a road in there and say we can do it. No, so, well, I mean, you know, I, I, what do we have? It makes more sense to me now why the topic came up. I was just having trouble mapping that to what you were saying previously, which I, I thought we were all set. And then I thought it was like, oh no, we now need more. So this is a crossing the T's and dotting the I's discussion point, but certainly something that, again, we're you know trying to be cooperative with our neighbors. You know, so. Okay. There is an FDA standard, standard, so I can follow up if you'd like on that. So, because I, I thought you were talking about the internal area, because there was the question of the curb cut, and they said it's not a curb cut; it's because it's the driveway access between the senior center and the Legion parking lots. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was okay, thought right. you were talking about. Okay, yeah, there's so many areas. Yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. Think about, yeah. Yeah. I thought for a second you meant in the front where the ballards are. But that's, <laughs> <yeah. laughs> Anything else on the library or the senior center? Uh, I don't have any updates, okay. um, you know, yeah, other yeah. than the planning board meeting is next Tuesday. So, okay, so we'll have something next mm -hmm. Wednesday. Yep, library committee met, um, we met on Monday. Um, but again, we're just rolling through our set. process. All set? Yes, thank yes, you. Thank you. Oh, I guess one update is we did vote on the senior center to go with a shingle roof um, on the senior center unless there's any changes at the next town meeting that allows a metal roof to be on a building in the historic overlay district, such as the senior center. Mm -hmm. then so they're going to bring out another roof. thing for the, for the fall town meeting. Yeah, and it would be an op right now it's going to be an option on the construction documents to have a metal roof. We're going to be moving forward with, for presentation to the planning board next week, a shingle roof. Because the planning board said when we had that um, uh, discussion with them that it was the the way the bylaws currently worded is what is causing them to say no to the metal roof. standing scene, yeah. whatever you call it, metal roof. Yeah, that's right. And that and this question was posed, well if if the, I mean, because back then the bylaw didn't necessarily contemplate the fact that all of the existing buildings would then have a metal roof on them. So now, if we brought it back to to keep actually the character of the whole thing and make it conducive to solar, mm -hmm. maybe town meeting would want to go for allowing it on new construction as well, and that would impact the library. So that was a conversation with Jimmy Max and Muskie, and said, "Yeah, that's what would have to happen, right?" Yeah, yeah and I've prepared an article for that. Okay. Uh, let's go back up to uh, water abatement process. Um, well, I, I'm well, sorry, just before, can I just ask? Sorry, I interrupted yeah. you. Yeah. 
just before we leave the building projects, but as Christian said, we do have that planning board meeting next Tuesday. So, does it, and where where do we stand right now relative to their issues being addressed? What's the latest? The latest I heard was that Tom Reedy was working with the OPM and the architects in order to come up with the uh, solutions to the three issues raised by the planning board. Um, I haven't heard anything specific. I know that they've been working with the Conservation Commission about using some of the green space for parking. Uh, they've been looking at, the, at uh, alternative to parking designs, uh, but I haven't seen anything specific at this point. Uh, the, the OPM did say that he was going to have Tom Reedy get in touch with me this afternoon. I haven't heard anything. Mm -hmm. And I know they were digging test pits over at the oh, yeah. senior center today, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. which was part of the overall I drainage we had design. On that property. We did the boring. We did boring they wanted the test pits, and I don't know how that influences the whole design. But they were digging it today. I know that was a Hurdle. Yeah, five five pits, twelve feet deep. And it, it, I was instructed or well, told that um, they found nothing but sand. So that's that. a good that's a good thing. Yep, that's a good thing. It's the center of town. Little spare is <laughs> um, Okay. Now so at some point, depending on what happens next Tuesday, um, I mean, if it gets approved, then that's good. But um, one thing we did talk about at the, the library building committee is, again, just um, I think you know, the select board certainly needs to be aware of the costs that are increasing here. So, um, you know, they're estimating it about, I think Mark Sullivan said it's like $1,000 a, a week, I think, at this point. So, well, what can we do to move it forward? Yeah, so yeah. I think you know we need to get through next Tuesday. It's not our fault the planning board is is, uh, is well, in charge of it right now. So well, I'm just saying. So once next Tuesday is big, but if if for whatever reason next Tuesday um, there's not agreement, then I think given the fact that the select board is really charged with the ma overall management of all of these projects, I think we need to start um, becoming more aware of the costs of these things and 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 have that discussion brought to the select board for a holistic discussion of the library and the senior center and, and what we can do in, in terms of um, looking at ways to potentially mitigate costs. Mm -hmm. um, if well, everything goes go according to the next week, we'll <coughs> have more money we'll have to spend on Mr. Reedy. And that $10,000 will go up to more than $10,000. And where is that money going to come from? So like I said, mm -hmm. hopefully everything goes according to oil, but if it doesn't, yeah. I think we really need to start talking about that because we're talking some significant dollars here. Okay, water abatement process. Marlo. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to bring uh, to the board's attention how, how we handle water abatements now um, and what I'm proposing to, to change. Uh, as it exists now, we handle the, the sewer abatements at the DPW. Um, I just recently uh, was informed that the, the water abatements were being um, handled um, in the town hall. So I took a look at the process. Um, basically, the process is you know, the application will come into the select board's office. Um, um, five copies will be scanned, one sent to me. Uh, two, two of the administrative assistants, the collector's office, and then uh, one to Jan Janice Kangas. Um, and then the process is we'll request from the collector's office the history and copy of the bill, um, request from DPW a recommendation, which Mike, Mike, Sharon, and I will give a recommendation, but as of late, we, we've just discussed it in the office and I give the recommendation to, to the select board's office. Um, so once the vote was taken at the select board's meeting after the recommendations were given, um, Janice downstairs would notify the, the, the resident of the results of the abatement. Um, so I'm proposing just to streamline this, cut it back to two copies, um, basically the collector's office, my office, um, deals directly with the select board's office. And then the DPW would make the phone call after the vote is taken. Um, it's part of the streamlining process. Um, putting both water and sewer abatements in the DPW. Um, I mean, that sums it up in a nutshell. 
How often does it happen? Uh, what do we get? Two or three, four uh, per cycle. Um, you know, sometimes it, it, it's all done in the collector's office if it was an error read or something went, went wrong with a gun or something. Um, but overall, I don't think we have many as, as a general rule. Yeah, bill four times a year, so there's yeah. usually one or two. Yeah. Um, to, to abate based on a computer error or some sort of reading error. And then, then there's, every now and then, there's a significant issue with somebody with a leak claims that the, the leak was not actually their fault or their responsibility. We always want to keep customer service close to the source. So. Yeah, well, that's the other part of it, too, keep it under one umbrella. Um, I mean, ultimately, when it comes to the board for a vote, for discussion, it's the same thing. It just it, It's streamlining how it makes it to you folks, really. Well, is actually, it really doesn't need to come to us unless we have to have a hearing and somebody is uh, coming before us with an objection of how, you know, it not being fair or whatever um, and want to state in their case, but if it's cut and dried, it really doesn't need to even come before us, I don't think. Actually, I think it does. Does it? Yeah. Except oh, there's okay. a law that requires this. Oh, okay. Well, why aren't the wastewater ones coming to us? Though? Because we're, we're really the sewer commissioners also. They do come. They do come John, to John, I think we're talking about process to get the process to you. To they the do board. come to us. Yeah, yeah they do I come have, to you. I have seen them. But yeah. yeah, yeah. But they don't, they don't come in the same form as the, the water ones. So if they, there's an abatement, they do. Yeah, it's on the same form. Yeah. But water and sewer recommendation would come from the DPW as opposed to, I, I should say, the paperwork being handled in the process to get to you folks on the board is handled all in one spot now rather than water handled in the town hall and, and sewer handled in, in our office down there. Just put it two together. We're, you know, overall we're not talking about a lot of time. It's a matter of saving some paper and taking some steps out of it and streamlining it directly to the board is, is what it boils down to. Well, I don't know if it's something we need to vote on as a, as a board, but I'd like to make a motion to change it to the rec recommended new process. And um, it's, like you said, it eliminates paperwork. It takes uh, a couple people out of the mix there. And uh, it starts bringing everything into a DPW as a DPW should be both water and sewer. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Oops, Dan. Okay. Third, and then uh, seasonal and temporary workers for the DPW. Uh, David, you wanted this on too with uh, yeah. Marlo? Yeah, um, I'll let Marlo, Marlo speak about it, but basically it's a way to um, get some economical temporary help. Uh, without all the associated benefits and long-term costs of the town and all that keep going? Um, yes, I, I have a lot of experience with what I call a summer help program uh, from, from when I came from Greenfield. Um, it can handle a lot of the, the, the small labor that, that, we, that we do on a daily basis and the, uh, the uh, qualified people can be doing you know, other things like setting drainage or repairing drainage, so on and so forth. Um, You're talking like um, painting fire hydrants, mowing. Yeah, like mowing. Yep. Um, you know, breaking some of the highway department free from the right. standard mowing uh, day to day. Um, so the other part of it is um, in our field, um, it's dwindling as, as John knows, water and sewer uh, licenses. Um, the, the program is three or four fold. Um, in my experiences over the years, um, we, we've actually had uh, summer hires or temp summer hires uh, come to the DPW full time and be successful in water and sewer or highway or whatever. Um, some have actually gone through college, come back all four seasons, come back 10 years later. I don't recognize them and say I became an engineer I'm in a DPW out, out east somewhere. Um, I think it's, it's more of you know, a community thing here also. We can talk about the process, you know, further. But you know, the way we handled it in Greenfield was generally um, Greenfield um, college student got first right to refusal, or they had to be 18 years old. Um, they'd come back year after year. Um, if you didn't get any applicants within the town, then you go, you know, outside the town. I mean, we had a pretty, pretty hefty program in Greenfield. We hired 12, 13 a year, but that's not what I'm looking to do here. 
Um, so I just wanted to lay it out that you know it'd be good for the community to get a community college kid involved, make some money, go back to school in the fall, um, get some of the general labor done, um, gain experience. Um, in my experiences, some of the summer help their second or third year, they were jumping right in with highway and water and sewer and doing, doing you know some skilled stuff. Um, so. I do have temp wages line item in, in, in all my budgets. Um, I mean, it's not bountiful for, for three or four people, but it was a program I had brought up uh, back when I did my organizational change about a year and a half ago. It was part of my org chart. We just haven't gotten back to it to, to establish it, but I wanted to bring it to the board's attention. It's something I would like to try uh, next year, possibly one, maybe two, depending on budgeting. Um, so I drafted up a, a job description and, and what a you know a posting would look like, uh, and I would, would welcome any comments from the board or. I said the more the that. merrier, as long as you can manage them. With one, two, three, four, whatever you can handle. I mean, why not? Mm -hmm. Do it now. You got two ones. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. But you need them right now. It, well, by the time we get it posted and figured out where they're going to go and what we're doing, I think we're, they're going to be getting ready to go back to college. I, I find that a lot of them usually knock off like the second, third week of August, bring them in July 1 or, or in June when they, um, if, if they're in college, you know, between years. But I think by the time we really got it rolling and got it posted out there and, and, and got interviews done and, and got them hired in, I'm more than looking at a, a couple of weeks before. What about done. seniors in the, in the high school that might be going on to Agricultural or something of that nature. Or even military, military, yeah. military, military. Right, and that's something you know. Be interested too in setting up something with the superintendent to have that put out there to see if the kids would be interested in something like that. Yeah, you know, and as I, I drafted it to be 18 years of age and have a driver's license, that's one of the only requirements. Um, it's pretty amazing once you you, you get. Some of them train how independent they can work. You take the truck and go off with a zero turn mower and, and mow the town facilities for the day and then go. You have kids go. over at Smith School that are from Hadley that might be interested in uh, working for the town there in small engines or things like that, which yep. would be repairs and things like that too. So um, certainly would be worthwhile exploring that this year, coming year for next year too. The wastewater treatment plant needs a coat of paint on the walls on the outside, you know. Mm -hmm. All kinds of there's all kinds of work for them that, that we struggle to catch up to this time of year. We're busy with everything else. So the only recommendation I would, would probably make was if the board could give Marlon the authorization to begin doing this now, and if he uses it, good. If not, then you know we can start doing it next year. But um, oh, certainly, you know, if we're if we're hiring people at eleven dollars an hour with no benefits versus thirty, forty, fifty dollars an hour with these highly licensed, certified people that are making a lot more money. I mean, it's a good way to save some cash. So. All day long. I'll make a motion to authorize Marla to uh, implement this program at his discretion. Second. Any further discussion? The only thing I was going to say is to have like a term, you know, an end date or a start date maybe, but other than that, I have no other idea. Yeah, it's usually it's third week of June, first week of July, depending on what's left in the yeah. budget at the end of June. Yeah, yeah. Um, we start looking in March or April generally. Taking the apps or into May as as you know, the, the college kids are. Getting yeah, out. I could just see somebody applying and be like, "Oh, just stay here and keep working or yeah. whatever you want to do." So yeah. just having a term, and, or, so they can have expectations how much you're asking to yeah, work for. Temporary. Yeah, temporary. Yeah, yeah. Temporary. And if you can get them to come back there three or four years of college, it, it it's, believe it or not, it's a pretty good incentive to have. You know that that quarter range, eleven to eleven twenty-five or eleven fifty. It's like the lifeguards at the yeah. beach; they're the same ones over and over for yeah. four years while they're in college. Yeah. yeah. You know. I, I have had some very good experiences with this. It's, it's pretty uh, it, it's pretty cool when they when they come to you, eight ten years later and say, "Hey, I'll never forget. You know, the first time I messed up on that morgue, you talked to me, and I'm an engineer now while I'm doing this or whatever." So it's it's uh, it's I'll a pretty good feeling on my end too. One question. So. You were just referring to the term term of employment. Term of right? employment, right. yeah, making that clear. Because I would be against um, limiting you on the term or the time of year you could hire them. Because if you have someone that has graduated from Hopkins and maybe have something that needs to be done during the winter months, yeah. I'd, I'd want to allow you to hire those people during. That's the what I was just going to say. If, if they work yeah. June and July and, and and they can work part time throughout the winter, even yeah. they can they got a license yeah. and can drive us pick up. They got another plow guy right there. Yeah. We just want to make sure yeah, that they follow the temporary. Yeah, 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 that's what I'm yeah. concerned about. Yeah. We got to be careful. You know, there's no overtime. Yeah. They can't exactly. work more than seven. I mean, the, the labor laws have changed a little bit, so 
we have to be very mindful of that too. Yeah. So I'm all for what you said. Definitely a, a term limits on the temporary employment, but I, I want to give you the authorization to hire temporary help all year round, basically if needed. Mm -hmm. so. When kids are on vacation, or you know, yeah, uh, yeah. we use them in the spring or the winter when they're on right. vacation. Yeah, take a semester off. My only fear yeah. is, my only fear is, you could take this and hire people at eleven dollars an hour and make them year-round positions that are part-time. No, no, and just yeah. don't want to yeah. abuse it. So you have to have like that. Yeah. 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 Well, I, that's why I say make right. it clear. Yeah. And, and, and I wanted to bring this to the board first with some sort of plan. You know, these drafts can change a little bit as as I work through it, but. I, I think the important piece was to, to see how the board felt about it, you know, and obviously I will, you know, sit down with the union and talk to them and, you know, make sure that we're all on board of, you know, um, the skilled labor isn't, isn't going to be done. I mean, it's uh, yeah, at the yeah. end of the day, so. So can I modify the motion? Sorry, I think you made the motion originally. What are you going to modify? <laughs> <laughs> I would like to approve the request, but make it a, uh, immediately and also strike summer from the job description and allow this to happen all year round. As, and and then we can also set a temporary time limit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so, so second on the second, yeah, second. Okay. So change one of the draft of the yeah. job description. Pick up yeah. summer, right at yeah. the top. Yeah. 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 Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Oops, okay. Yeah, great idea. All right. Um, Thank you. Affordable housing in Hadley. This is an issue that was raised by the planning board, uh, brought to the select board. Uh, the select board said that they would uh, take it under advisement, so this is the next available meeting to discuss this. Uh, it was suggested at the, by the planning board that this could be done by a consultant, and Pioneer Valley Planning Commission does have people who specialize in this issue. What is the pleasure of the board? I just have one comment real quick is I did, I had an event, I went to an event, let's say, uh, for the Kestrel Trust and I met somebody from Valley Community Development. I don't know if you guys are familiar with them at all. Mm -hmm. They said that they might have some interest in talking to us. I don't know what that would entail, but um, I don't know if that's something we can do in parallel to. Is that Joanna Collins? Who was, uh, yeah, I talked to Donna Cadana, but she recommended Joanne Campbell to talk Campbell, to her. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I uh, just a little bit. I so I'm on the um, board of the Valley CDC. Oh, okay, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I had brought in Joanne and Donna to the planning board. They went over and uh, worked with them a little bit. Um, they could come and talk to you and explain the whole process of how how it works. Um, they do it quite often, where um, for a fee, of course, um, they do the monitoring of it, the uh, vetting of the um, going through the low income to make sure someone is qualified. Um, they are. Uh, they deal with East Hampton, North Hampton, Amherst, and Hadley is in their area. But so who actually does the, the vetting on all of that now? So for the existing stock we have, do you know who did the income? Housing Authority? Housing Authority? I don't think so, because they don't want to do any it's, uh, additional... It's a uh, state agency, and the, the name escapes me, uh, under the uh, DHCD, uh, Department of Housing and Community Development. They, they do a census of our affordable housing and uh, give us a report every year. So would this be redundant or would this be a value added? I think this would be value added because uh, the DHCD just does this, the, the inventory, they don't. Does it cost anything to do this or is this she just said a fee? How much, are we, yeah. how much are we paying Pioneer Valley? Uh, we just got the bill and I think it was 800 and some odd dollars. But if we did it with Pioneer Valley, I would explore doing it through a uh, DLTA grant. Well, that's what I mean. They're, they're set up with the grants, and it, it seems pretty reasonable, some of the fees that they are charging us, and they're charging the planning board. Well, I don't mind talking to both of them. Yeah. You know? Shop I agree with you. I mean, I don't want to. Yeah. I you mean, know, if there's grant money available, on Pioneer, CDC does. Yeah. 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 And yeah. I didn't know if Valley CDC seemed like more about development. Where also we need some maybe negotiation 
with existing facilities as mm -hmm. well so mm -hmm. I don't know if they would do that yeah. um, because they really focus on the development but yeah. so yeah I mean they talked about that with the planning board a yeah. little bit yeah. so maybe we can have them come in and maybe the planning board would want to be present mm -hmm. as well here yeah. so this their development they focus on is that building lower income housing developments in communities is that what they work yeah on? so like yeah. there's uh, um in northampton right now there's the lumber yard mm -hmm. and there's I, I don't even i can't even remember how many units are going in there but they're all going to be the lower income housing so the applications will have to come in and they'll have to now those are apartments and it depends like they were involved with um what east street with the condos that's a little different because that's ownership right and that's where you get a six percent they they take like a six percent uh fee to to do that but the apartments are a little different because they got to keep up on it and they got to keep that uh monitoring it be because once it's, the, an ongoing service. it's an ongoing thing yeah yeah, okay. yeah i don't mind finding out more about what i mean yeah what I, they have to offer and then compare that to planning commission because i think we have to kind of look at a multi pronged approach you know mm -hmm. do we need new development do we need to renegotiate with i don't think we should or personally be looking at bringing in more yeah. we're way over our numbers as long as we can keep what we have correct mm -hmm. so i mean we need to be doing negotiations with mountain view apartments that's what our, our goal is right now to mm -hmm. and some and of these others to keep Winfield. the percentage in winfield so the number of uh, low-income apartments that are there that's how it, how you get your number and your percentage um, and that's what we need to do with, with people that build those without adding any extra buildings well i think I mean, the message i heard from the planning board is they just want to make sure it was clear to us that it is our responsibility not theirs right to to manage this mm -hmm. and <clears throat> that we've kind of been resting on our laurels almost to a point because we had so much inventory but the rules change and all of that so we need to have a program in place so i think that so my mind the question is who, who do we work with is it the valley cdc or is it <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm just keeping us awake. Yeah. Or the Piker Valley Planning Commission. Yeah, we, we, don't, we don't know. We don't yeah, know. Maybe whoever, services. Whoever's work. most effective, then yeah. maybe a, a consortium of people that would work with. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'll work with Amy and mm -hmm. uh, we'll start putting something together for a little bit later on in the summer mm -hmm. in terms of appointments and talking about options. Yeah. All right. David, do you have anything for your report, short and sweet? Short and sweet. Um, I was up in Lake Winnipesaukee for a week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> good, short and sweet. Thank you. <laughs> we'll move on since you haven't been here. <laughs> well, actually, there's a lot that's going on, but let me uh, just give you the, the, the major updates. Uh, we've talked a lot about this already. Town Hall fire alarm system and DPW uh, fire alarm systems are expected to be installed at the first week of August. Uh, we'll have to do some coordination and make sure that we're not interrupting uh, our, uh, our operations. Um, worked with the department heads today about the special town meeting coming up, making sure that people know that the deadlines are important and that uh, we are working uh, to prepare a draft warrant for you all um, and uh, capital plan we had a meeting of the capital planning committee we didn't manage to make quorum but we had a very good discussion uh, about dpw and the capital needs uh, chris i don't know if you have anything to amplify there yeah, no, uh, Marlo made a really good presentation that he put together that we just talked about in the meeting. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's anything. I think that's good to see the 10 year, um, see some of the needs that are repeat needs year after year, and then have some long range planning um, options in there as well. So I think it's, it's good. 
All right, uh, upcoming of town actions and community events. The Hadley Farm Museum has got a new sign up. They're open on weekends. I recommend people go. CPA funding request due July 30th. Special town meeting articles due July, August 1st. And then we have a POCO mass coming up on August 5th. If any questions arise, for, I didn't go over much of the details here, but we know where to find you. You know where to find me, and uh, there's a lot happening. Okay. Yes. One quick thing. Um, we've got an update on the, there's been a lot of questions on the new crosswalk. A lot of phone calls have been coming in. Latest news I got this, this morning was, they're just waiting, everything is done, they're waiting for Eversource to hook up and then start testing this thing. And Good luck. Yeah, yeah so Tim was saying <laughs> the meeting this morning. Yeah. Yeah. Eversource is a real problem. Yeah. So that's where we're at. That's why it's been sitting there for three or four weeks since the electrical has been done. The inspection has been done by the town. Um, so just wait that ever so. I got one question. Sure. Did we, did we get our money yet from the insurance? From the uh, I, uh, I reached out to commercial insurance. I said, here's the claim number. What's the, uh, the deal? Give me a call. I have not heard anything back. Can so, we just send a bill from the town to the people that did the damage, just since their insurance company isn't taking care of it, and uh, go that route in the meantime? Because all right, that's it's what we'll do. Been pretty, just a demand letter or something along those lines, yep. because it's getting silly at this point. Okay. In large, dark font. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we just wanted to, um, in open session, say that we now have a uh, contract with our chief of police for the next three years. We settled that with them at our last meeting. So I think that's for signing. Yes, that's uh, right. Tonight. Do we need to have a motion in open setting? Make a motion to approve the contract as negotiated with Chief of Police Michael Mason. I forgot who he was for a moment. A second. <laughs> <laughs> and any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. All right, and then we were going to just uh, touch lightly on what our um, there. goals and objectives for the select board. Uh, at a future meeting, uh, we should discuss uh, and bring forward with us our goals and objectives, and um, we have all these people to do. We have... Uh, no. This is just that inventory, inventory from the project. Yeah. Okay. So, but I think what you're talking about is the the goal setting for the department heads. Yes. That are due. Due. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So you've got about five uh, department heads that you normally ask for uh, do some sort of evaluation and set some goals for uh, the town administrator, building inspector, chief of police, chief of fire. DPW director, I don't think I'm missing anybody else. Usually start with a request that we do a uh, self-evaluation based upon what we uh, identified as goals and objectives from the prior year. And then using that information, then you can go ahead and put together your evaluation and set goals and objectives for the coming year. So, so I was thinking about this today. Um, I mean, and they're, they're going to be the um, grassroots goals and objectives. So the department heads come to us and say, you know, we really need to. But then there are other goals that are more organization-wide that seems like we should work on at least some of them. Mm -hmm. um, so just, you know, I keep having this dream of us actually having a strategic plan someday. But um, try to nip off pieces of it, you know. So, I mean, developing an interim solution to address human resource, IT, and finance needs. You know, I think we have a sense of what the longer term solution is that involves far more significant funding and staffing, but we still need to get from here to there. Um, long range plan for the town buildings, including the swing space for the library and senior center construction projects. Um, identifying efficiencies and cost savings opportunities at the administrative function level, which is what the stuff that's here is, and we already agreed that we we're, you know, we're going to form a subcommittee. I'm going to try to get that going in August. Um, 
long range plan for the planning function itself. I mean, planning board members keep coming in saying, look at us, you know, we're going to have to leave. We'll that. Um, and then a comprehensive review of salaries and benefits for all town employees. I mean, we keep pushing that off and pushing that off. So, I mean, those are things that probably aren't going to come necessarily from the department heads when they come in with their goals. Um, and I'm wondering if we could have the opportunity for everybody here to come up with their own list and then, again, pick a few off because that's going to help inform what we may be asking people who are involved in supporting these things would do. Yeah, I was going to just bring up at this point or some point, I was just going to ask if it's possible to have either one more meeting a month or some kind of like retreat session where we could kind of focus on some of these higher level issues that are separate from a lot of the more monthly things that we're addressing in a lot of our meetings. It seems like we don't have time to dig into some of these things to really talk about them. Is there another meeting we can do it where we don't just focus on one thing or you know, do a retreat type of thing um, to talk about it? Yeah, we've, we've talked about doing a retreat before. I was talking with uh, the school superintendent and found out the school committee is doing something for their next meeting on July 30th where I think it's a 3.30 meeting where they're doing a normal meeting, and then I think it's from 3.30 to 9.30 or something like that. They've blocked off a number of hours to try to have a strategic planning session and, and do some things. I thought that was a great idea to do something along those lines. It's an open meeting, but it's also an opportunity to have a broader discussion. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we can do anything like that. Definitely in favor of doing it. That's what kind of chunk of time you're looking at because and when we all have time to well, that's the thing it's going to be to do it. on people's schedules. I work every day till five so yeah I mean my my schedule is flexible but things come up and all that but uh, so, I mean if we did a five thirty to nine o'clock or nine thirty I think six hours is a chunk of time that's that's of doing this kind of stuff is mm -hmm. kind of tedious you could do a Saturday morning or something we do a Saturday morning when summer's over we could take a Take one in the in the fall, or have or do a what I was day thinking. one have lunch and you know mm -hmm. do that type of thing, or just having another meeting a month where it's focused on a particular issue and trying to minimize the amount of. I would prefer a Saturday where we could just get at it at nine o'clock in the morning and yeah, be done by noon or something. Be done by yeah. noon or three o'clock in the afternoon instead of taking, you know, another evening. Um, can you do that, David? I can As long as it's far enough in advance. Yeah. You can schedule a Saturday. Yeah. Why don't we, why don't we look at a Saturday, you know, coming in in the fall and see what we can do? But for something like this, how what kind of deadline do you see? Well, that's the problem we always get into because we we get jammed mm -hmm. up. You know, everything's you know seems to revolve around the town meeting, so you can't do anything until the annual town meeting happens, and then town meeting happens, and then, oh my gosh, we guess to a town meeting, we got to take a break. Then we get, oh, now it's summer. And then so we reduce the number of meetings, but that's, normally you want to have your goals set for the upcoming year, at least at the beginning of the year, yeah. and we're already a month into the new fiscal year, and we haven't even talked about this stuff yet. So it's like we're always off kilter, and it never seem to have a good well, way because to now we're also getting into the fall town meeting. We're picking up things that were left off from the spring annual town meeting and picking up, leaving off and getting things finished up because we haven't gotten the budget yet from um, the state. So we don't know what our cherry sheets are going to be. We won't get those numbers till God only knows when because they haven't even finalized their budget in Boston yet. They're one of the, one of the few states right now that have not set a budget. So when does that mean the rest of the towns and cities in, in Massachusetts will have an idea of where, where they stand, you know? Mm -hmm. So you're kind of your ha hands are tied for some of these things, you know? I mean, I think a lot of this stuff, at least, and again, this is just what's in, in, in my mind, doesn't, I, I don't see it necessarily having a huge impact on the fire chief, the police chief, the building inspector, DPW director, David on the other hand, you know, so. 
Yeah. Maybe it's a matter of keeping his a little bit looser until we get through this process and then you're supporting. Oh, I don't know. What do you think? That'll work. But we still want to do the performance reviews for the prior year for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, part of the process is that I come to you sometime in October anyways, and I say, okay, we're going to start working on the next fiscal year, and there's got to be some sort of marching orders that go to the department heads. And that's all based upon what are your goals and objectives, and what is your vision for the town. Um, but like this year, using that HR, IT, and finance, everybody said, yeah, those are huge priorities. Yeah. But then we ran out of time because we... Yeah. bumped it up too close to so I think that's why we have to do it before that October right right yeah right. And that's what you're saying could we just devote a meeting that's already scheduled to doing some of these tasks and just not do any you know, not take any critical new business or not do a you know a ambulance update or whatever that that meeting and then just catch up on all that stuff the next time around unless there's something urgent that needs to be I think I think today we did an ambulance update because of it oh, just oh yeah no, just it, it was it started was helpful. I'm just saying for, for the yeah. future yeah, let's I, just focus I, on knocking this out. I don't foresee us having an ambulance update every time we have oh, a meeting. Sure. Yeah. Um, we'll have a quarterly report probably for the yeah. oversight committee. Yeah. yeah. Well, what about your agenda for August 22nd? Um, the only thing that's on there is uh, Mr. Rotuno will give you a. a five-minute uh, presentation on the, his internship. There's no other issues that are on your agenda at this point. Well, let's do some of that then. That's what the whole meeting and be done with it, where you think we can cover what needs to be covered in that one meeting? And do <coughs> that? Well, I think, I think mainly if we're setting goals, there'll probably be a whole bunch of, okay, well, you guys go do that. I mean, to do's coming out of it to finalize it, but yeah, I mean, if we could at least get the framework in place. How about the um, evaluations? Can we do that at the same time? As far as uh, as far as that, I gotta take a little longer. Yeah, yeah. It takes a little bit longer. Yeah, we don't like to give people too much short shrift. Okay. You did a fine job. Next. <laughs> <laughs> you not so much. Next. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'd be a, just curiosity. I think last year we did the self evaluation and, and then we came back for kind of a goal, the new goals and objectives. It was yes. kind of like two separate meetings. Yeah. yeah. Just curiosity, what would be the thoughts of combining them and, and get the department head completed in one meeting? Because some of the goals and objectives carry over the following year if we presented them that way. Mm -hmm. um, just, uh, just a thought. I'm, I'm just trying to think from my if perspective. If you're ready to do a self-evaluation and present your goals, then that's, I think that would be fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be good. That would be good. And we always you know, reserve the right to swap something out because something yeah. else comes and say, well, you know, so now that we've done this, we think so we'll let's, let's pick this. some to come on the 22nd, and do the that gives them a month's time uh, to do their evaluation and set their goals and we'll do it in August. Okay? So just to be clear, I, uh, August 22nd I wrote down goals and objectives for the uh, select board. Uh -huh. We're going to be adding um, goals and objectives for the department heads. Is that That's going to take up the whole meeting right there. Yeah. No, I mean oh, just, that. just the department okay. heads. Be. So which is more critical, the evaluations or the goals and objectives, or they think is, which comes first? Well, the self-evaluations should be with the goals and objectives, so I wouldn't anticipate that they, like Marlo said, they spill over to one another, so. But I think what David's asking is, do, do we want to commit the time as a board determining what we think the overall goal should be for the town for the year or devote the time and so again it's kind of a problem because I mean, my own opinion is always you take care of the people stuff first because it's not fair to 
you know, especially if you have constructive criticism, then somebody's three or four months into the next cycle. Right. Don't have a chance well, I think some of our goals and objectives are what our department heads bring to us. Um, and what we feel would be our priorities and our goals for the coming year and what, how we would prioritize what they bring. So the Department of Revenue has recommended that the select board develop a five-year strategic plan. Okay, that's a lot of work, mm -hmm. with a lot of unified vision, visioning. Um, we've been making incremental steps towards getting that. There are a lot of pieces that are falling into place. Uh, to, to help make that happen. You did the uh, SWOT analysis, for example, at the beginning of the, the attempt to look at, okay, so what are, what is the shape of the future for you in terms of good things and bad things, things that are challenging, things that are going to be easy. Um, we've done a number of other things, such as the financial management uh, report by the Department of Revenue. Um, I mean, I think and the, the master plan and pretty soon the updated open space plan. Um, I think these things are helpful to put together a strategic vision. I think one meeting of the select board is probably insufficient to come up with that five-year future look forward. Um, but you can, you can use that meeting as a way to begin to put together immediate goals, intermediate goals, and long-term goals for the time. To me, yeah, that takes more than one meeting. It's going to be, I mean, either adding an extra meeting a, a month or having some sessions to kind of focus on these things. Without that, I just don't see us being able to get it done. But what if we did, on um, August 22nd, what if we did the, the, the employees piece of it, the department heads of there, and then plan on a, a, another meeting that's an extra meeting for just the select board, whether that's a Saturday morning or whatever. Okay. Or another Wednesday night, whatever. That's fine. So we'll start with August 22nd. So we'll start there. Mm -hmm. so and the department heads. Okay. Do we want to address this issue again? next week to try to schedule a further meeting or how do we you know maybe Joyce could can you and David like throw out some dates that's what I'm working on right okay okay right now all right so we have September 5th September 19th September 26th I think the farther you put that off the closer you get to your top meeting and uh, things get jammed up so I'd, I'd say September 5th is your best opportunity but that's a meeting we already that's have a scheduled, meeting. right? That's a We're talking about adding one. So adding what about August 29th? Is everybody around, or is that? No. That's, not, that's before the Labor Day. The 12th. That's September 12th. Uh, oh, are you talking a Saturday or another Wednesday? I'm talking about another Wednesday. I don't, I'm not around on Saturdays till the end of September. Yeah, the 12th. Fell off the ladder today. God knows what I'm going to do today. <laughs> you want to start? Oh, he almost fell off at the camp. Uh, on the ladder. Yeah, it was September 12th. Did you go home? Yeah. Get the my calendar, right? I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> my, my husband made me switch. I loved my iPhone. I didn't put you in touch with Mr. Android. Uh, okay. The 12th, yeah. Well, he's on. The 12th. Is that what we September 12th. Uh, September 12th. The headquarters? No. Uh, another race in August. I'm not sure I'm going. But this is September. Oh, September. So September 12th. Oh, okay. That's that okay? Yeah. Okay. Alright, so that looks good. No, the August 22nd one I might not be able to make. Okay. Alright, let's, uh, any news or announcements? We have Mr. Boisvert. Yes. <clears throat> yes, uh, John Boisvert Jr. has uh, reached the end of his probationary period. Uh, he works in the highway department. Came to board early uh, January. He had most of his licenses uh, when he came, came on board with us. Uh, during his probation, he went out and he got his 4G uh, license for the, for the large mower, roadside mower. 
Um, he's fit into the crew wonderfully. Um, certainly, um, he, he likes to get his tasks done. Um, um, very timely, very quiet at times. I wonder if he's there, but he's, he's always getting something done. I was, I was tinkering. Um, so he's been a great addition to the department. Um, and I would recommend to promote uh, full status uh, probation. Need a motion for that? Mm -hmm. okay. Make a motion that we accept the recommendation of the DPW director relative to Mr. Boiser. Second. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Abstain. Welcome aboard, Mr. Boiser. Mm -hmm. Probation. You had one, right? I did have one. I had uh, condolences to the family of Nellie Zankowski Griffin. Um, she was the holder of our golden cane. Mm -hmm. And um, she was 100, I believe. How did she was her? It was 2013, she turned 100. So. Oh, wow, 105. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, somewhere in that range. Four and nine. That's blessed. Um, so anyway, to her family, we offer our condolences. Mm -hmm. And uh, can we entertain a motion to go into executive session? Oh, oh yeah. Sorry. Um, make a motion that we go into executive session per the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting might have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the chair does do declare. Um, we have a couple of, or three items tonight, actually, not four, three items tonight. Um, first one <coughs> related to land court case number 000190 and DV, uh, contract negotiations with the DPW director, and strategy for litigation um, relative to uh, Mountain View apartments and a water issue. And not to, convene, not to reconvene in open session. And the chair so declares that uh, going into executive session uh, is, is it, well, I don't get any of these things. Uh, for the, it would be a detriment to, the, uh, to be in open session. Yeah, the discussion in open session, session would be detrimental to the interest of the town. That's it. Thank you. So we better print that out for him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, roll call vote. Roll call vote. Whiskers. Yeah. Hello, we're here. Yes. Um, yes. Ms. Keegan. Yes. Mr. Stanley. Yes. Yes. Right. Congratulations, your second session. Thank you. I hope it will not be too long. Thank you. 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 Thank you.